Guys, if you have your Bibles, Mark 5 is our text this morning. Mark 5 is where we will be looking at. This morning we are beginning a brand new series um, called Unhindered. Um, the last several weeks or months we've been looking um, at the Sermon on the Mount, but today we begin something new. And uh, during worship, Chi read our text that we'll be looking at this morning, but I want to, as we begin, take you back about 3,000 years to a valley just south of the city of Jerusalem. It's a valley today that is barren and empty, but 3,000 years ago there was a valley where there was a major struggle that happened. And fight between two armies were happening, but this was an unusual warfare because during this battle, one army would sit on one side, the other army would sit on the other side, and for 40 days nothing would happen other than a giant that would walk out into the middle of the valley and shout and scream. A day after day, this man, a giant of a man, would lumber out. He's the original Megatron, a massive giant by the name of Goliath, standing nine feet tall. He wears about 250 pounds of armor, his enormous bulk armor and weapons alone is like about 600 pounds. One colossal mass of brass glistening in the sun, the Philistine weapon of mass destruction. Every day Goliath would come out and strut his awesome stuff. And every day he would belch out his blasphemies across the creek and he would yell, he would say, bring out someone to fight me. Let him come out and fight me. If your man wins, my entire army will submit to you. But if I win, your entire army needs to submit to me. And the Israelites would cower behind rocks, mesmerized, hypnotized, paralyzed, unwilling to answer the giant's challenge. This would go on for 40 days, and let's be honest, little has changed in the 3,000 years since. Every day, giants come to challenge us. We crawl out of bed every morning, march boldly into battle. We bang on our shields. We rattle our sabers. We boast that this time we'll beat Goliath, but then all of a sudden the giant roars and our courage melts. What giant comes against you today? See, Goliath had four brothers, and the Bible says that all four of them were giants as well. Sometimes giants come to us in packs. They come in all shapes and all sizes. Their names are familiar to us, just as Goliath's name is familiar to us. It could be lust, or it could be fear, or it could be suffering, or it could be shame, or it could be prejudice, and others just as ominous. See, only you know what giant is coming against you. Only you know what struggle you face. And over the course of the next several weeks, is what I want to do is I want to look at certain giants that have attempted to paralyze us from being victorious in our Christian life. We'll be looking at topics such as shame and lust and distractions, prejudice, fear, failure, memories of our past. See, Unlike our Sermon on the Mount series, we're not going to be looking verse by verse from a book of the Bible, but we'll actually be going throughout the Bible. We'll spend some weeks in the Old Testament and some weeks in the New Testament, but we're wanting to hear what God has to say on these specific topics. Let me say this as we begin. These topics weren't just randomly chosen. I didn't just sit one day and say, let's just speak on this. These were topics that I've heard you guys tell me over the last 12 to 18 months of things that you're struggling with in your life. And so these are issues that as a church we are facing. These are struggles that we face. And because one part of the body is struggling, it means the entire body is struggling. And if one part is hurting, we're all hurting. And so I want you to know that your struggle is not you in isolation. It's all of us and these giants that we all face in life. And we need to find victory in these things together. All of us have dealt with shame, right? Some of you Maybe you're old enough to remember the Southwest commercials from a few years ago where 
One of them that sticks out to me was the guy, the water bottle deliverer. He would deliver the bottle, and he's walking down the driveway, and he sees a basketball. He picks up the basketball and shoots, completely misses the court, um, and hits the glass window in the garage, shatters it. The family's sitting there, and all of a sudden, Southwest um, Airlines goes, want to get away? Beep, and like you can just kind of get away, right? And you've guys been in situations like that where there are times where you're in an awkward situation and you just wish there was something that could come up and say, want to get away, and you could just disappear and somehow be on an island or um, on the beaches of San Diego or something. But you know that even if you can't define the word shame, all of us have felt it because all of us have done things of which we are ashamed. Shame is the feeling where we have radically disappointed ourselves, we've radically disappointed others, and we've radically disappointed God. And as a matter of fact, shame is a painful emotion. It is so painful that people will do anything to avoid it, but shame wasn't part of the original creation of God. See, there's not a one of us that hasn't faced this giant called shame. Some of us in this room have lived with him for years, and we don't know how to get rid of him. How do we beat this Goliath? How do we eliminate him from our lives forever? See, beating this giant is critical more than you can imagine because of this truth that you need to know. Shame corrodes every part of us that believes that we are able to change. Shame corrodes every part of us that believes that we are able or capable of change. See, the enemy of our soul uses two giants as like a tag team wrestling combination to wrestle us to the ground. The first is lust. He seduces us with the appeal of sin. Do you remember the original paradise all the way back in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve were living there. Everything was going well, and all of a sudden the serpent shows up and tells Eve that the forbidden fruit would actually give her stuff that none of the other fruit in the garden would give her. Genesis 3, verse 6 says, The woman saw that the tree was, fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye, and it was also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate it, and then she gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. See, lust took them down for the fall. But they weren't out for the count yet. Then all of a sudden, shame jumped in into the ring to finish them off. He reminded them, you're naked now. Your innocence has been stripped away. You have messed up. They're now flawed and twisted by sin. And so they cover themselves up with leaves just the same way many of us cover ourselves up and hide when we are ashamed. They ran from each other. They ran from God. See, shame makes us believe that no one could ever love us. No one will love us if they really see who we really are under the leaves, under the covers, if they really know the deepest, darkest secrets of our lives. It makes us believe that God also will not love us. And so what do we do? We hide. And God shows up and says, Who told you you're naked? Shame told them. Shame said you're naked. Lust leads us to sin. Shame ties us to it and won't ever let us go from it. The enemy of our soul specializes in fixating us in our sin, both in its pleasures beforehand and in its consequences afterhand. And in doing so, he keeps us focused on ourselves rather than focused on God. Shame corrodes every part of us that believes that we're capable of change. Our text this morning from the Gospel of Mark introduces us to a woman who has been held by the stranglehold of this giant for 12 years. For 12 years, her life was a life of shame, and she tried everything to escape its grasp. And finally, she found her way to the great son of the first giant slayer, David, and she came tentatively, slipping quietly through the crowd, daring only to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, hoping he wouldn't notice and no one else would notice. And in her sling was only one stone. It was a stone called faith. But listen, faith is enough to topple any giant. Jesus says in Mark 5, 34 in our text, he says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed 
of your disease. See, it takes a great deal of faith to overcome shame. What is faith? See, it's the ability to see what shame tries to hide from you. That God wants to forgive you and that God loves you. You may be frantically trying to cover your shame with fig leaves this morning, hiding from God and everyone else around you, and you might be trying to hide in a huge forest hoping that no one will see you, but God is looking for you. He says, Adam, where are you? Eve, I'm come for you. Eve, I've come to rescue you. Yes, I'm going to expose your sin because you cannot move on until I do, but I'm also going to sacrifice a lamb for you, and I'm going to make a new covering for you. Faith believes that God's search for us took him all the way down to his own tree, that he hung naked on a tree with his shame being exposed while he carried all of our shame on him so that me and you, we can be free only if we're willing to touch the hem of his garment. Our story is a fascinating story. And when you learn the details behind the story, it'll amaze you at the faith of this woman. And from this story, I want to give you three lessons this morning, three things I want you to remember. Number one, faith overcomes the rejection of shame. Faith overcomes the rejection of shame. Here is a woman whose suffering and humiliation beggar the imagination. A few words in verse 24 and 25 sums up her degradation. A great crowd followed him and thronged about him, verse 24. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years who suffered under many physicians. There's a delicacy that hides the situation here. To put it in modern terms, she is suffering from continual menstrual bleeding. A study of medical records showed that a number of women have suffered with this rare disease throughout the years. Only a woman can understand what she must have gone through. She lived in an age where there was no feminine hygiene products. In primitive days, women were literally forced to retire from culture and from the public sight during their time of the month. Imagine what this must have meant for a woman that lived in 34 AD. But imagine for a Jewish woman, this was like a living death sentence for her. See, the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus condemned a woman to complete isolation during her time of the month. Everything she touches, everything she sits on, is considered unclean. Everyone who touches her is unclean. Anyone who touches someone who touched that woman is considered unclean. Anyone who touches her must wash their clothes, ritualistically clean their bodies, and see themselves as unclean for an entire day. She might as well have been a leper. And after her time of the month ended, she had to go to the temple and offer a ritualistic sacrifice for her uncleanliness. That was the type of age that these women lived in. See, we might cringe or even get angry at these laws. They seem grossly unfair and incredibly sexist, don't they? The Bible nowhere tells us why God ordained these rules in the Old Testament. We don't know why this rule was there. What's important for us to know this morning is that this woman was born, lived, and died under these rules and rituals. She had no choice in the matter. She didn't ask for this condition. Verse 25 in the NIV says that she had been subjected to this bleeding. The Greek word for subjected mean, is in the passive form. That means that she didn't cause this to happen. She didn't deserve this. It just happened. You could say it this way. I didn't deserve this shame on myself. I didn't deserve what happened to me. The fact that we didn't cause our handicap or our job loss, or our financial struggles, or the embarrassing things that our kids do, or a thousand other things that cause our life to go into a tailspin or, and expose our frailties to the watching world doesn't make our shame less painful. 
or less real. See, but here's the upshot for this woman. Every day of her life for 12 years, her religion said she was unclean. Every day for 12 years. Think about the ramifications of that. She was never allowed to be touched or touch someone. Everything she touched would be dirty. After a while, she herself felt dirty. She had no choice but to withdraw from people and society. If she had a husband, she couldn't have intimacy with him. In fact, she couldn't even sleep in the same bed with him. If she had children, she couldn't hold them. If she had grandchildren, she couldn't hug them. Shame isolates us. It separates us from everyone around us. After he had to resign them from the presidency because of his Watergate scandal, Richard Nixon was quoted as saying, I went into a black hole, not wanting to see anyone or have anyone see what I had become. See, like Adam and Eve, we want to run away. We want to hide our terrible, nasty sins under the cover, lest anyone discover it and expose our shame. We find it impossible to believe that others would love us if they really knew who we were. So we would rather crawl back under the covers and sulk in our shame rather than throw off the covers and take the chance that the sunlight of forgiveness would bring us new life. This woman was isolated from her family. This woman was isolated from her friends. This woman was isolated from society. But beyond that, she was isolated from God. For 12 years, she couldn't go into the temple. For 12 years, she couldn't go to her neighborhood synagogue. She wasn't able to bring a sacrifice for cleansing until the bleeding stopped. For 12 years, she never darkened the hallways of a sanctuary. And even if she went, she knew that her orthodox religious folks would never touch her lest they became unclean themselves. See, I wonder how many bleeding folks don't come to church because they think that we don't want to touch them. We don't want to love them. Shame isolates us from God. Like Adam and Eve, we think that God wants nothing to do with us. We begin to assume that we're the only ones with this condition. We imagine that our sin is the unpardonable sin, so we stay away from God and his people. We think that we aren't good enough to do anything for God. We think we're not good enough to do ministry, so we pull back. We just come, we sit, we go, we never engage or get involved. And now the enemy of the soul has done the worst damage he could do to us. Not only... Has he debilitated us with shame? But he also pulled us from the front lines of ministry so that we can't be a blessing to other people as well. See, no wonder scriptures say that the enemy of our soul is the craftiest of all creatures. He will use shame to destroy your life. See, but this woman's faith overcame rejection. Verse 27 says, She heard the reports of Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be made well. Guys, it was no small thing for her to silently weave to the crowd. She had to be incredibly careful that she didn't touch anyone else in the crowd. She had to be careful that she didn't touch Jesus. So she said, what if I just touch the hem of his garment? What if I just touch a small piece? If I could do that, maybe I will get well. It was tentative. It doesn't take much faith. But listen, a little faith can move mountains just a little bit. You only need a little. You only need enough to come to Jesus. You don't need a lot. You just need enough to come to your Savior. Number two, faith overcomes the disappointments of shame. Faith overcomes the disappointments of shame. Verse 26 adds to the story. It says, She had suffered under many physicians, spent all that she had, but grew no better, but rather grew worse. Do you see the desperation of her story here? Three things tell you much about her. Number one, she spent all that she had. Number two, she had gone to many doctors. Number three, she suffered a great deal. 
lots of visits, lots of promises, lots of remedies, lots of medicine, lots of exper experiments, a few quacks and charlatans along the way, and not without plenty of pain and unintended side effects. And after all of that, the result? She's broke. She has nothing left. She has no money left. For 12 years, hopes rising, hopes being dashed. And after a while, the cumulative effects of disappointments naturally is to give in and to give up. You guys know this. Is there anything more painful than shattered hopes? Is there anything more devastating than hopes being destroyed from our lives? We'll say things like, this little situation is hopeless. My marriage is doomed. My struggles will never be over. My kids will never get it right. There is no hope for me. I've tried everything. Nothing will ever change. See, that's when shame takes you down for the count. It knocks you down and leaves you there so that you won't get up. But this woman doesn't let that happen to her. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him and touched his robe. See, there's one giant slayer that can be trusted. See, I don't know who you've gone to. Maybe you've gone to doctors or psychologists or self-help books or faith healers. Maybe you've worn others out by rehearsing your struggles to them over and over and over to anyone you listen. Maybe you've turned the entire world into your own personal therapy group. Or maybe you've just given up and gone under the covers and you're just waiting for time to pass by. But can I ask you, have you taken your shame to Jesus? Have you taken your shame to the one that can ultimately heal you? Shame overcomes the, faith overcomes the disappointments of shame. And number three, faith overcomes the source of shame. Faith overcomes the source of shame. See, what's the real issue here? What's the real issue of shame? For this woman, it's a blood issue. The blood never stops flowing. What's the purpose of menstruation? It's to shed the uterine lining, and it washes away all of the unfertilized eggs. See, even if her husband wanted to touch this woman, this woman could never have children. Her womb has been rendered barren. For 12 years, she was unable to give birth. Isn't that our problem? Sin has rendered us barren and basically said we're dead. See, we're unable to solve the most basic problems of life. We visit doctors, we go to faith healers, we try new religions and self-help groups and self-medicate and try whatever's out there, the newest and latest stuff that's out there. We suffer, we spend all that we have, but nothing solves the sins. Nothing fixes the shortcomings or nothing dulls the pains of our lives. We cannot give per birth to perfection and we can't even find temporary fixes that will last longer than just a few days. So we desperately need for someone else to give us not just a temporary fix, but we need someone to give us new birth, new life, and make us a brand new person. Go with me back to the Garden of Eden to the first sin, the original woman, Eve. See, when God found her cowering in shame, he threw back the covers and he exposed the shame and the sin in her life. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't pleasant. But God didn't hang a sign on this woman and said, this woman is a sinner. He didn't make her climb back into a life of shame as well. Instead, what does God do? He makes a promise to her. He said, I'm gonna, you're going to give birth to a son. And God was speaking more than just Abel, Cain, and Seth. He was looking down the corridors of time to the great son, Jesus and he said that this son of yours would crush the head of the serpent. And not just that, he would crush the head of every other giant in your life, including shame. His shed blood would wash away every uncleanliness, including Eve's and this woman in this story and yours and mine. His blood washes away 
whatever is trying to destroy our lives this morning. So here's the most amazing part. The blood that washes away our impurities, the blood that washes away our sins, that blood never stops flowing. It never has ended. It never ceases. The old hymn writer wrote it this way, there is a blood that's drawn from Emmanuel's vein like a fountain. It keeps flowing until it becomes a river washing over the sins of the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, cleansing them from every sin, every shortcoming, every reason for shame, every reason to hide, every reason why we run away. He says, my blood has washed it away from your life. See, one day, She touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and verse 29 says that immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed from her disease. Her blood stopped flowing, but the precious blood of Jesus has never stopped its cleansing work in our lives. It still flows today. 2,000 years later, you and I are the witness that his blood still has power. It changes us. It transforms us. It makes us a brand new person. And so we don't have to cower in shame. We don't have to cower in fear. We don't have to worry about what other people think. The opinion of the one that matters says, you are loved. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are my child. You are mine. The blood of Jesus has never lost its power. Can I ask you, have you come to that fountain? It only takes a little bit of faith. It only takes enough just to touch the hem of the garment. But if you believe, it can wash away all of the terrible nasties of your life. So I promise you this, when you plunge beneath that flood, it will lose all its guilty stain. The giant called shame will be forced to run for his life when you plunge into the blood of Jesus. Years ago, let me close with this, I was in the middle of a situation at my home church that caused me and my parents a lot of shame. I was a pastor's kid, and if you're familiar with pastor's kids, we're not the best kids growing up. We have a lot of rebellion in us, and I was unfortunately in the middle of a situation that caused myself a lot of shame and my parents a lot of shame. And without going into a lot of details, it was a painful period for me to go to church week in and week out. My dad was a pastor, like I said, so I didn't have a choice of trying to stay at home and avoid people. But every week I would go and I would know that people were talking about me and what I did and friends and people didn't want to associate with me. The church was actually divided over what to do with me in that situation. In the midst of that, I came home one day and I was just worn out and just beat up and I just broke down and just started crying in my room and my parents hearing me cry came into my room and tried to envelop me in their arms and I'm in between my sobbing. I'm trying to apologize to them for embarrassing them and my father hugged me and I'll never forget this. And he said, Sam, we will always love you no matter what. No matter what you do or no matter what you ever will do, you will always be our son. And I don't remember a lot of conversations I've had with my dad, but that one has always stuck with me through the years. It's changed how I approach life because I know that no matter what happens to me, I've got a set of parents that will always love me and be supportive of me. But isn't that just like God? Isn't that God? He says that, I love you. No matter what you have done, no matter what you're doing right now, or no matter what you ever will do, I died for you knowing full well all the stuff that you will do in your life. I love you unconditionally, and there is nothing that you will ever do that will make me stop loving you. There is nothing that you will ever do that will make me stop calling you my child. There is nothing that you will ever do that will make me disown you. I love you. I love you. Some of you this morning needs to hear those words. You have a God who says, you're not just a believer. You are his child. He loves you. He loves you regardless of what you've done or where you've been or how nasty the sin was or how disgusting the struggle was. I love you. You need to hear that this morning. I love you. If 
The blood of Jesus has washed it away. It's washed away the sin and the results of sin, the shame, the guilt, and all the ways that you have tried to back off. You've been forgiven. So let me ask you this morning, if that is true, why are you living defeated? If that's true, why can't you step up to the plate and live the victorious life that God says you have because of Jesus? Why do you say you're not good enough or worthy enough or that you're not capable enough? You are saying that the blood of Jesus isn't enough for you. Listen, that's not true. You have been forgiven. Not just for the sins you've already confessed for. Jesus says, I've accepted you knowing the sins you're, already going, to, you're going to commit in the future as well. You are a child of God cleansed by the blood of Jesus, the blood that never stops flowing. So you can live your life victoriously. This giant called shame has no dominion over your life. This giant called shame has no power over your life. This giant called shame cannot keep you down any longer. The blood has washed it away forever and ever. In a moment, we're going to come to the communion table. This table is important, and we do this week in and week out because it reminds us week in and week out that we're not sitting here because of our gifts, our talents, our abilities, our wisdom, or our knowledge. We're sitting here because while we were yet sinners, God sent his son to die in our place. That while we were yet sinners, Jesus came onto this earth. He lived the life that you and I should have lived in absolute perfection, never sinning, never messing up. He lived the life that God demanded of us that we weren't able to do. And then he died the death that you and I deserved. He hung on the cross, taking your shame and your sin, taking my shame and my sin, and took all of that so that this morning we sit here not worn down in shame, not held down by lust, not held down by anything else, but we sit here forgiven, cleansed, accepted, and loved by God. So when we come to this table, we come acknowledging, Jesus, you are worthy of my life. You're worthy of my worship. I don't have to live defeated. I don't have to live discouraged. I don't have to live in hiding. I can walk victoriously because your blood has taken away my shame. So this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your life. What is holding you back? And maybe for some of you, it is shame. But for others of you, it could be some of the other things we'll be talking about in the next couple of weeks. But what is holding you back? This morning, do you believe that Jesus is more than enough to take care of whatever giant is holding you down? Come to the table this morning. Don't come guilt-ridden, don't come burdened by what sins have strangled you. Come knowing that God loved you while you were still a sinner. Come knowing that God has loved you, accepted you, forgiven you. Come as a child of God. This morning, if you are not a child of God, can I tell you, Jesus loves you more than you could ever dream, more than you could imagine. And he wants to welcome you into his family. You're not here simply by accident. You're not here because you had nothing else to do. God drew you to him to be here this morning. Would you respond to him? Would you respond to his grace and his love and forgiveness? As we come to the table, let's come humbly, acknowledging Jesus, you love us. Your grace is sufficient for us. You are awesome and worthy of our worship. Father, today, we thank you that this giant called shame cannot defeat us. For many in this room, it has held us down for too long. But we thank you that the blood of Jesus has washed us clean. That we can live our lives victorious, bringing glory and honor to you that we don't have to live in defeat or discouragement where we could walk and live our lives in a way that brings honor to your name. So today as we come to the table, we come thankful for what you've done for us. Thankful that you sent Jesus to die in our place. 
We love you. We worship you. As the worship team sings, would you take a moment and examine your heart and just spend some time with God? And then whenever you are ready, you are welcome to come and grab the elements from the table and go back to your seat. And I'll come up in a few moments and we'll partake of the table together. Let's worship.